Hi, welcome to episode two of Nonfiction for Life, the podcast with authors who write compelling true stories and books with great ideas for living well. I'm your host, Janet Perry, and today we'll be talking to Charles H. Vogel, author of The Art of Community, Seven Principles for Belonging. Charles has always been involved in making a difference. In his early 20s, he was volunteering at a homeless shelter and serving in the Peace Corps in Zambia. He worked as a PBS documentary filmmaker and also as a labor organizer, working to empower abuse workers in the restaurant industry. In his 30s, he decided to attend Yale University, where he received a Master's of Divinity. While he was there, he had some powerful experiences building community. Now he works as an award-winning leadership author, speaker, and coach. And he draws these principles from more than 30 years of community and spiritual tradition to teach others how to inspire powerful connections. He works with leaders in technology, finance, media, government, and other organizations. He inspires powerful connections and critical relationships. Today he'll be sharing some of his time-tested ideas and rituals for all of us to apply to our own communities so that we can foster and create meaningful cultures of belonging. We welcome Charles today. Thank you for joining us on the program. Well, it's delighted to be invited. Many things in your book will resonate with our listeners. Um, we'll start in your 30s when you went to graduate school at Yale. And that's where you and your wife, your now wife, started a community of your own. Can you describe that experience for our listeners? Sure. Uh, so um, I had done a number of fun things in the world before I went to graduate school. Uh, and But one of the things I noticed in my life was I had never found the exact place where I knew that I belonged, where it was pretty clear that all the people around me thought that I belonged there. And when I got to graduate school at Yale, one of the things I discovered is that the brand of Yale is so old and looms so large that many people, turns out many more than me, when we showed up on campus, we were convinced we could never be good enough to actually belong there. And it was actually so bad that I would walk around the halls of my graduate school and I was actually worried that at some point an administrator was going to tap me on the shoulder and explain to me that they discovered there'd been a terrible mistake and I absolutely didn't belong there and I'd have to leave right away. And it turned out that I was – there were several of us who actually believed that there's going to be a discovery that we were led in by accident. And so um, in those first months reflecting on wisdom, mentors – had shared with me, my wife and I uh, started creating a dinner on Friday nights, and all that meant was we would make a meal in our home, which was a small home there for graduate students on your campus, and anybody who wanted to join us for dinner could. And of course, what that meant was we didn't know who would come, we didn't know how many would come, and in some cases, we didn't know if anyone would come. And what I discovered was that um, it was clearly a bad idea at a number of levels. Uh, at one level, um, I didn't know how many people to cook for because I didn't know how many people were coming. Um, and then anything else that was fun on a Friday night, I couldn't go do it because I was planning to make this meal for people I didn't know would come, right? But uh, we really wanted to create this venue where other people could sit down together and get to know each other without running to classes, without writing papers, without having to be in some room listening to someone who was ostensibly important just to build relationships and we kept that commitment going regularly and what happened uh over time was after the first year the series which is what it was gained some um popularity and it grew so large that we had after we'd hosted over 500 people in our home over the time we couldn't keep up with making all these meals so we had to turn to our friends who are also the regulars of the series, and ask if they would also plan the meals, cook the meals, serve the meals, and of course clean up afterwards. And so what ended up happening is we started creating a series of teams to produce this series of dinner events, and well, the rest is history. Uh, that series would go on to host 
untold thousands of people over years and inspire other dinner series and host not only students, but faculty members and department heads and visiting lecturers and ethicists and theologians. And it became a really wonderful place where we could build the relationships that built the community, even though a lot of people felt desperately lonely there. So a couple of keys here are that you felt lonely and you knew you were reaching out to other people who felt lonely as mm -hmm. and you were trying to build relationships you were trying to build friendships and out mm -hmm. of that experience you distilled these seven principles for belonging that you propose in your book the art of community and today we i want to talk about that book the art of community and um begin with first of all this experience that where you were in this process of building a community, but how, just how conscious were you of the process as you were going through it? <clears throat> well, let me share that you're absolutely right that all the principles that I've written in the book, The Art of Community, did show up in this community that we formed in graduate school. Uh, uh, However, the principles themselves I've distilled from 3,000 years of spiritual tradition, and you know that my graduate degree, my official graduate degree, is one in religion. And so these are principles I've distilled down that they can be used in building any community, and for the purposes of my work, I define community as a group of people who care about the welfare of one another, right? So a bunch of people in grad school together who don't necessarily know the names of everybody, and if they did, they don't know their backgrounds, or don't know their aspirations, or don't know their challenges, may not actually care about one another. So how does someone go from a people in a room together, all selected to study the same thing, to people who care about one another, i.e. a community? And so I used the story of our experiences at Yale to help illustrate how these principles help grow us from a bunch of people kind of scared to be there to people who are now lifelong friends and support one another, even though we live on different continents years later. Uh, so you didn't even have any idea at the time how far reaching the effects of this Friday dinner night would have in, until you met with your friend from the Philippines who was gr getting ready to mm -hmm. graduate and he wanted to explain mm -hmm. what kind of effect it had. Can you tell our listeners about that? Sure, and absolutely. I'll, I had no idea when we, quite frankly, made something that looked totally humble. We made a homemade meal on a Friday night, and in the beginning anyway, we didn't even know who was coming. Eventually, it became so popular, we had to have a sign-up list just so we could manage the enthusiasm, and we were running a wait list. But you're right. In the beginning, it was the seemingly most humble thing, people making a meal for people they didn't know who would show up. And uh, about five years into graduate school, my friend Milo invited me to lunch um, at what we call the Yale Commons, which is a giant dining hall on campus. And so in this giant dining hall, just the two of us sat at a table on the north side. And underneath that vaulted ceiling, he shared with me that uh, years ago, uh, his first year at Yale had been the hardest year of his life. And he explained to me that he had come from the Philippines, and we arrived, the New England weather, of course, the um, – the workload and uh, the cultural shock was plenty of challenge for him. Um, he also learned when he got here that his wife, whose name is Jazz, and a medical doctor couldn't legally work in Connecticut, uh, and so she had to work hundreds of miles away to make ends meet. And so he was also then without his wife and in a new country. And in the midst of this, weeks after arriving to graduate school, um, his mother's fight with cancer got worse and she died. And um, his family could not afford to fly him back um, on surprise to the Philippines while he was doing his first semester of graduate school. And so he couldn't return home and say goodbye to her when she died. And, of course, he was new on campus, and it turns out, like me, felt really lonely and wondered if he belonged there. And so he shared with me that he was crying alone at night. And hopefully everybody listening to this podcast has done that at once, at least once at least so we have an empathy with how hard that is. And then he shared with me when he got through that year and he got back to the Philippines, he had to consider, well, what was next in his life? And he said that he knew that he would never return to Yale um, because he wasn't strong enough. And it didn't matter that he had a full scholarship and it didn't matter that it was the best school in the world for what he wanted to study. And it didn't matter that not very many Filipinos get to study at Yale. 
He just knew he couldn't do it. And then he shared with me while he was in the midst of that thinking, he remembered the invitations to our dinners. And he said when he remembered that, he knew he wasn't alone, and then he knew he was strong enough to come back. And we were having lunch weeks before he would walk in the ceremony to get his diploma, and he wanted to share with me that those dinners, those invitations, and all the people who created that space changed the course of his life. Because now with that new degree, he was going to live a whole new life than if he had stayed in the Philippines. That is a really powerful, powerful example. After that experience, though, at Yale, you still didn't mm-hmm. immediately write a book. You didn't write this book, The Art of Community. But first, th- tell us what did motivate you to write the book, mm-hmm. and then explain mm-hmm. why you chose the word art, the art of community. Mm-hmm. Great. Those are great questions. So when I moved out here to the West Coast, which is to say out of an academic institution and trying to find a way to apply what I've learned and my experiences in a way to the world that would help other people do things that are important. Uh, One of the things that I did is I had lunch with a guy named Kevin Lin. Kevin is one of the founders and still the chief operating officer of a company called Twitch. And for your listeners who don't know what Twitch is, Twitch is an online space where online gamers can come together and connect, um, often through use of video. And to date, they have over 100 million unique users a month to give you a sense of scale of the people they're putting together. So I was at lunch with Kevin. And while we were at lunch, Kevin was explaining to me how he knew uh, that they had grown to, at the time, having tens and tens of millions of users. And he knew how many online gamers there are in the world, so he knew how big they could still grow. And, of course, we now know he was right. But one of the things that he wanted to do better was to connect the people who were already using the platform, to create a stronger community amongst people who have found one another from around the world on Twitch. And he explained to me that they didn't know how to do that. And they also just didn't want to experiment experiment randomly and break this community that had been formed in, for the first time in the history of the world, right? It was formed at a scale that had never been precedented around a, around a, um, a subject or enthusiasm that, of course, is new, online video gaming, if you look at the history of the world. So while we were sitting at lunch, and I remember we were sitting over tostadas, I remember having this feeling that my head was about to explode with thoughts because I saw in that moment that he had spent the last few years building a global tech company, and I had spent the last several years studying spiritual traditions and activism and making a difference, and there was this way that we could come together, at least intellectually, to create something that was brand new and that could connect people in a way that apparently nobody has been doing it before. And so after that lunch, I went home, and the truth is I was writing another book, and I was sick of looking at that book, so I wanted to write something different, and I thought, oh, I'll write this thing for Kevin. I'll give it to him. that will help him run this giant tech company, and uh, the ideas kept coming, and when I was done, it was book length, and the good news is when my publisher saw it, they uh, saw the value for the world, uh, got it, bought it in a week, and now we're talking about it and can share it with people besides Kevin. That's fascinating. Um, tell us then why you chose that word art when you describe mm-hmm. building communities. Yeah, I'm delighted you asked about that. So one of the tenets of my work, Janet, is that there's no one magic formula on how to bring people together so they care about one another and they feel confident they belong. Um, And because of that, that's an art. Now, there are principles that make a community stronger or less strong, and we can turn to those, but how we interpret those community for your group makes a difference. And if we understand these are principles and not formula, right, then we can understand that we can apply them to a group that's informal, like relatives like to go on vacation together, or formal, which might be a professional association, something that is um, highly structured, like, say, uh, the Boy Scouts, or something that uh, looks like it has no structure, which might be an affiliation of bush pilots who just support each other in Southern Africa, right? Uh, But we can apply principles and know that because these groups are so vastly different, that we're going to have to use our knowledge of the values of those groups, of the preferences of those groups, of the cultural context of those people to create the community that's rich for us. 
The bad news is there's no magic formula to apply, and boom, you'll have success. The good news is because there's no magic formula, you get to find the one that when you build it feels entirely comfortable, supportive, and attractive for you and the people that you want to feel connected to. And that's what makes it an art. And I think that's what makes your book so appealing on many levels and for so many different people. And there are people who are hungry for this kind of experience. In, your, in the preface of your book, you quote some really sad statistics. You said one in five Americans report, report that they're lonely. You say, um, uh, let me just read some of this. The number of people who say that they have no one to talk to about difficult subjects has tripled in the last few decades. Moreover, the size of the average person's social network decreased by one-third in the, in the same time. In fact, more people say they don't have a confidant than those who say that they do. That's really a sad commentary on a world where we can connect so easily through technology, and yet inwardly people are suffering. They're still... Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, first of all, uh, another thing you say is that millennials are more likely to join a cause than a club. So there's obviously a need and a desire to connect. But what evidence do we have that shows, first of all, that we're aware as a nation of these changes that are afoot? What kind of things are you seeing as you go around the country talking to people and consulting? Mm -hmm. What efforts are people so, making to overcome them? Well, golly, I, d I don't know how to answer that because I'm not confident that writ large, we as a nation understand how unique this generation, this time seems to be than any other time in this country's history and maybe in the history of the world. Um, so just to give you a sense of context that we're experiencing that we don't have precedent, certainly in this country yet, is the rate at which Americans are leaving their fa um, faith institutions. Now, Americans don't necessarily feel that differently about God or their spirituality, but they're unsatisfied with the institutions that historically have served Americans to do that. And there are a number of things going on there, one of which is we're a much more cosmopolitan culture than we used to be before. And Americans are exposed to more ideas than previous generations were, and those institutions have not necessarily changed themselves to accommodate a more cosmopolitan, more diverse thinking uh, generation. But nonetheless, those institutions are playing a lesser role in bringing Americans together around shared values. And when we leave those institutions, one of the things that we also lose are the rituals that mark important times of our lives and bring people together to mark those times of our lives. So that's unprecedented. Another thing that we're seeing that we haven't seen before at this rate um, is a segregation by um, generation. So the number of older people that young people have to turn to and ask uh, about important areas of their lives and difficult areas of their lives is uh, remarkably low. Um, I remember at one point reading cystic, I don't remember the source, said the number of older people that uh, 20 somethings had to ask about important subjects uh, was between zero and three, which is to say that if you're an older person, not in your 20s, and you befriend a younger person and talk about important subjects like uh, career and romance and life choices, uh, you may represent um, half or 30% of the older people they have to turn to ask about those questions. And part of that is facilitated by our new digital life. Our relationships are like sequestered in certain subcultures, and we don't need to talk across generations large part. So there are just a lot of changes going on that we haven't seen before, and they're showing up in ways that, are, that we haven't yet accommodated them. And I think that there are a lot of efforts to bring people together. Uh, a lot of them are online, and online resources provide a lot of upside. And Americans are voting by the hours they're spending there on how valuable it is. But one of the things it looks like is online relationships never actually uh, replace or fully replace so-called offline relationships. And in fact, talking to Stu McLaren, who's an advisor to hundreds if not thousands of online communities and making them powerful, he says the most powerful thing an online community can do 
is create a way where people, once they meet online, can meet offline in the real world. That doesn't mean that the relationship has to be, become mostly offline, but give people an opportunity to sit in the same room together. And I'll just share with you, while I was talking to people who are in leadership at Twitch, um, the, I learned a really fantastic story in helping me understand this. Uh, Twitch is a company that seems to have plenty of resources to do whatever they want to do to bring together you know, over 100 million people. So if it's a good idea and it can be done technically, they're probably going to do it. Uh, also, they have enough people in the world connected that they can find out who wants to do what uh, because there's, just an, there's such a broad user base to give them feedback. And two, there were two things that stood out to me in the conversations I had there. One of them is Twitch uh, years ago found out that users – we're meeting up around the world offline to meet each other in cafes and bars. And I was remember talking to one community manager, and she was really baffled by this, excited by it, but baffled that they were meeting up, and Twitch wasn't asking them to do it or supporting that or asking them to do anything in these groups. And when I heard that, I immediately recognized what was going on, at least I thought I did, which is communities that are growing and strong want to have a temple, and that's one of the principles of my and the temple is simply a place where we can go and meet people who share our values and enact our rituals. And all I mean by rituals in this case is things that we do that have meaning, that transcend their function in our lives. Right? So a, a meal that you have to celebrate a birthday is not just a meal. It has meaning to mark the getting older. So um, Twitch members wanted to gather in a temple and meet each other in a physical space, and at the time, Twitch wasn't providing that. So they were providing it themselves, which is really exciting. And the second example I, want to, I like to bring about that is um, Twitch had made a really um, embarrassing mistake in how they had designed one of their upgrades. And they did it in such a way that millions of their users no longer could use Twitch the way they wanted to use it. And when Twitch found out about this, uh, within days, I started trying to correct that, and over weeks they would. But I remember talking to uh, DJ Wheat, who's a manager at Twitch, and he said, Charles, I don't know how this happened originally. He didn't know how it happened because they know their users. They're all uh, Twitch people are, ga are gamers themselves, and, and uh, they, of course, know how people are using the platform. So how could they create something that would alienate millions of users? And what they learned out of that was even though – Twitch designers or gamers themselves, because Twitch had grown so big, they couldn't stay in touch with their users as much as they wanted to. And so what Twitch learned was they, to this day, fly certain high-profile members to San Francisco for three days to have conversations with them to learn how they're using the platform to inform Twitch how to grow the platform next. Well, here's what I want you to understand about this. This is a multi-billion dollar company now owned by Amazon that has access to all the digital tours and tools in the entire world. And they're bringing, people, they're bringing people together who love being online. And Twitch discovered to grow in the ways that they want to grow and be connected, they want to be connected. They need to physically fly people to San Francisco headquarters to be in the same room with them and have conversations. And I think it's a fantastic lesson for all of us. Nothing wrong with online relationships, and they can serve us well. At the end of the day, nothing's better than sitting in the room with someone who's important to you. Absolutely. That's, there's some sweet yeah. irony in there, actually, and it's, yeah, I think it's beautiful that they've come to see in a very real way that, that people do need people, and they need to see their face, and there, there needs to be physical contact. You've touched on several of your seven principles. So let's let's go back and talk about a couple of these. You mentioned rituals and that mm -hmm. people are not um, benefiting from the kind of rituals that they once did, either through churches mm -hmm. or clubs and so forth. Um, you mentioned in your book that there are informal and formal rituals. Maybe you can give us mm -hmm. an example of both and tell us if one or the other is more strengthening to a community. Uh, so I'll just say that I, I think that both have their place. Um, and in, a, in an informal community that's new and small, it may be uncomfortable to create formal rituals right away. Uh, rituals are something that um, – rituals give us meaning 
in our lives. And all I mean by meaning is uh, it helps us understand how we, and if we're coming together, our relationships are connected to the past and how what we're doing now is important to the future. You and I are doing an interview right now to share with others. And that could simply just be another conversation that's being recorded. If we frame that differently, and I hope honestly, and we say that we are standing a tradition of people who are finding ideas that can enrich other people and using the technology of our age to share that so other people can come together more powerfully, then this conversation has more meaning. And if I put into this conversation, um, this time is important for you and, you and me because if five people hear this conversation and they go into their church, their synagogue, uh, their club, their family, or their company, and they're able to bring people together so they feel more connected and feel more supported in difficult times, then this is an important conversation because it's helping others. Then all of a sudden you and I on a recorded conversation has more meaning. And I believe that all those, those things I just said were true before I said them, but by saying them, by making them present, this conversation has more meaning, and we may feel more meaning in our relationship. Well, rituals can do that without just blabbing all the time. And there are ideas, there are actions that have meaning. So I'll give an example. A formal ritual uh, might be a birthday party. Uh, and in the United States, the way birthday parties typically look is a friends and family of the birthday girl will come um, to an appointed place. And when you get there, you expect a couple things to happen. One is there will be some kind of food there. And at some point in the evening, somebody's going to bring out something that will look like a cake, homemade or bought. And there will be candles that in some way represent the growing age of the birthday girl. And that there will be singing. And then there will be a blowing of candles and a making of wish, and then probably hugs and congratulations before people leave, right? And this may, there may be well more involved in that, or it may be only what I just described, but at some level, it'll include these forms, we call it, in ritual. So uh, the reason it's important to talk about ritual is when we understand that that is a ritual and that the forms make it meaningful, we can then play with that to see if we could make it more meaningful if we wanted to. So in the book, I talk about the idea, well, what if we invited all the family members to bring a candle themselves? So when that cake is put together, it's put together with candles from the family that supports the birthday girl. And what if before the lighting of the candles, um, each family member from youngest to oldest shares one thing that they appreciate about having the birthday girl in their lives for last year? Okay. Is it a better birthday party? I don't know. It depends on your family. But we are playing with these ideas that there's meaning there, right? And then the meaning and values we could be bringing to that new ritual could be the role of family and supporting someone as they grow older in, in maturation. Okay. An informal ritual could simply be something that, uh, between friends that isn't within a structure of a family, for example, but let someone know that uh, – that relationship has meaning. So I give the example in the book of I have a friend who was very successful early in life, and he's marginally famous now. And because of that, there's a lot of people who want to say that they're his friend. And uh, we met, and I think that we're friends, but I noticed there's a lot of people who want to say that they're his friend. So I didn't know for a while whether I was really friends or we just part of a, a group of hanger-ons, so to speak. And then I remember one night, uh, in the middle of the night, that friend called me because he had just broken up with a recent girlfriend and he was having a hard time. And he called me in the middle of the night to have a conversation in a, in a tough night. And for a couple hours, we talked about you know, what was next for him. And I was aware that he probably doesn't call people who are just pretend friends. He only calls friends that he trusts and thinks they're going to support him in a difficult emotional time. And that was a sign to me, that conversation was meaningful, that we had a deeper relationship. And, it, and that was, in my book, I would call it initiation, is that I understood that we had a special relationship different than the hanger-ons. He could have created an informal ritual at a different time where he had just found me, put his arm around my shoulders and said, Charles, I want you to know 
uh, I really appreciate that you're a real friend, and I know whenever I call you or ever I invite you to join me that you're coming because you want to support me, and you're never asking me for money or access or um, an endorsement. You just want to have a relationship that's supportive, and that could have been an informal initiation into this more intimate friendship. This this actually really underscores your uh, idea of using the word art, the art of communication. Mm -hmm. There's no one set way, but it does happen through an, uh, kind of personal efforts. The, the other thing that you touched on was temples, and that word to me has always denoted a formal building of worship. But mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was surprised to learn in your book that um, you can, we can create temporary temples. First of all, what's what's significant about having a, a place or a temple, mm -hmm. and what kind of what kind of power does that imbue in the community by meeting in a temple? Okay, so let me reiterate here that all I mean by temple in this context, the place where we come together with people who share our values and enact rituals. And those rituals can be informal. A birthday party totally counts, right? So that's all I mean by this. And if your organization is old enough and rich enough that it has a big, beautiful building, uh, great if that's right for you. For most communities, we don't have big, beautiful buildings, and we may not even want one. Uh, but giving us a place to go to enact our rituals allows us to create what we call sacred space. And all I mean by sacred in this case means set aside. So in this country, Thanksgiving is an important ritual. And in some ways, in some cases, it can be very uh, formalized, right? Who's hosting? Who, what, who's going to bring what? What time it starts? And that kind of thing. And in some families, it may be very, very informal. But nonetheless, Thanksgiving dinner is a different time than other dinners. And the Thanksgiving dinner table is a different space than other spaces. And if I don't know about your Thanksgiving table, but my guess is in a sacred space like that, that Thanksgiving table, there are things that you will say and do at Thanksgiving that you don't say and do other places. And there are things that you say and do not at Thanksgiving tables that you would never say at the Thanksgiving table. The Thanksgiving table is a sacred space. It's set aside and special. And because of that, the family eating a meal together at Thanksgiving feels more special. In fact, it feels so special that when that cannot happen because someone's traveling or there's a medical emergency, it can be missed more than every other meal during the year. So recognizing that Spaces allow us to create a sacred space that's set aside to feel that intimacy, allows us to notice what spaces are already becoming sacred that we haven't noticed before. And that might be somebody's living room, or it might be a cafe you meet, or it might be a soccer field that you convene on, right? And then when we recognize that those are special to us, we can notice how we're, we're honoring how it's special, right? And you asked about sacred spaces. A sacred space, um, so a little... Um, a backyard, maybe a backyard, 364 days a year. But that one day a year, uh, there may be a wedding in it. And that backyard it probably won't feel like a normal backyard. We want to make it special for the wedding day, right? And there's a number of ways we can do that. We can create a boundary around it, be it a ring of flowers or a special velvet rope. We can decorate it special, uh, specially with flowers or drapes. We can light it differently. We can make the sound different. So if that normal, if normally the backyard is really noisy with kids playing, maybe on the wedding day it's quiet, right? To honor the bride and groom coming together. Uh, obviously, we already talked that building community is an art. There's no magic formula. But if we notice, wow, we can make a space special. We won't do things here that we do elsewhere, and we're going to do things here we don't do elsewhere. Now we can play with how special that experience occurs. Charles, your final principle that you put forward in your book is inner rings, and you talk about it in quite a bit of depth. Can you explain this principle to our audience and how mm -hmm. they work in communities? <laughs> right. So the inner rings is the most sophisticated of the principles that I write about in the book, The Art of Community. And so I'll just give a brief description of it. Um, 
So the inner ring principle is this idea that when we join a community, formal or informal, we want to have a way to grow to be the person we want to be. And one way a mature community can provide that is there are more and more exclusive groups within the larger group that we can enter. But these groups or rings are not there simply to allow older members or more mature members to brag and be smug about how much better they are from new members. In fact, it's just the opposite. In a healthy community, the inner rings reflect a broader realm of concern. So let me give you an example. I was talking to a friend of mine who's an avid bicyclist on the East Coast. And, um, of course, new bicyclists show up, and they like to bicycle with this group, and that's fine. They allow that. But when you show up as a first-day bicyclist, you don't get to join the group that does the century rides or the 100-mile rides. And you don't join the group that does the multi-day mountain rides. And you don't join the group that does the most difficult um, downhill rides because you're a new bicyclist, right? And at some point, you may be invited to join those other groups, but not the first day. But those groups that do those rides, they're not there just to brag that they're better bicyclists. They, in a healthy group, are there to help the new bicyclists grow into being better at training, better at taking care of nutrition, better at recovery, better at, better at picking their equipment, better at planning their uh, trips so that they can eventually grow to be that better bicyclist. Right. Another way to say that differently is when you show up originally as a young bicyclist, you, you really more or less are concerned about one thing, your own experience. Will I be a good bicyclist? Will I have a good time? Will they like me? But as you grow into a more exclusive inner ring where there are less people, ideally your realm of concern grows. Because now I'm not just concerned about me, I'm concerned about my cohort, the bicyclists that I bicycle with. And if you become a leader there, hopefully you become concerned about more people. I'm concerned about all the bicyclists that are in a group and so on and so forth. And at the very top, or in the smallest inner ring, ideally the principal elders are concerned not only about the people in your own community, but you're concerned about how this community in total interacts and supports a dynamic world. So in a bicycling community, ideally the principal elder isn't concerned about supporting just all bicyclists, but how bicyclists interact with the dynamic world. And of course, in this country, it's how you deal with city government and city planners and insurance companies and, and motorists, right? All of these things are connected to how bicyclists interact in a world. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful. And it, it, from my reading of your book, it takes a while to develop those rings. And in some organizations, they seem to develop organically and other organizations uh, choose to make that more formal. But in any case, mm -hmm. um, I love the way you use the word mature communities, the communities that are truly uh, aimed at helping everybody grow personally, no matter where you sit in that community. Mm -hmm. So that's a very helpful explanation. Thank you for that. Um, we have listeners all over the map who are wondering, how do I create my own community and where do I start? And your book is fabulous in giving principles and lots of examples. You even have um, in the one of your appendix I, appendices is leader worksheets. So I'd like to just mention that so our listeners can use those. Um, but before uh, we go, I would just like you to give them some advice. Where, where's the best place to start before feeling overwhelmed that they have to create a community and make sure they have mm -hmm. all, these, all these principles nailed down? Where do they start? Right. Well, it's important to preface this by saying that uh, these principles that we've talked about here in this conversation, I've written about the book, they're not uh, assignments. Uh, they're great communities that do not map on the ideas that I've just described. And so if these don't fit or they seem like a waste of time, then maybe they are, right? So please don't feel overwhelmed that you gotta do what we've been talking about because maybe you don't for your community. Uh, these principles are just set forth that when you and I get wake up and we wanna bring people together in a more powerful way, and that could be a group of friends or our family or a volunteer group or our company or our colleagues, when we step forth to invest in that, 
and we're going to invest our time and inevitably money, uh, we have some principles to help inform how we're going to use that time. That's all this is here for. And so uh, just to understand the scale is going to vary. And maybe one principle or two principles are really going to get you to that next level you're looking for, but you don't need to invest in all seven. From my work, when I think of community, uh, I already described it as a group of people who care about one another's welfare. And we could nuance that a little bit. We could say it's a group of people who perceive a mutual concern for one another's welfare. And that, that perceive is really important because maybe you work in a place where everybody does, does care about one another. And if somebody gets in a car accident, everybody's going to show up at the hospital. And everybody's going to make sure their family gets dinner that night. But if you don't perceive that, it doesn't feel very community, does it? In some places, we think that there's a lot of support there, and then one thing goes down poorly, and all of a sudden, nobody knows anybody, right? They don't talk anymore. Well, gee, that's not supportive either. So, so if we have a group of people, we want them to authentically perceive that. And so we can start at the beginning and the, and the, and answer the question, do the people around you know that you care about them? And maybe the answer is yes. But when I have this conversation around the country, often what, ha what comes up is, well, gee, I don't know. Well, they should. They should know I care about them, and they probably know. Well, do they? And so I have a ritual that I have adopted in my life. I happen to do my birthday, but, but you can do it any day of the year. And I look over the last year of my life and what's changed and who's been involved, and I spend hours doing that. And one of the things I do in that time is I write down the people who've made a difference in my life that year. And then I schedule time to call every person on that list and simply tell them they made a difference in my life from last year, and it matters to me, and I care. And I don't know what they're going to say on the other side of the phone when I make that call, but often they say, well, gee, Charles, I care about you too, and thank you for calling me, and I'm glad that we have a relationship. And by the end of that day, I now have a group of people, it's usually a couple dozen in my life, that know that I care about them, and some percent of them have said they care about me, and that's the beginning of the community, right, if there wasn't one before. And if we're going to grow something, we've got to start with something to grow, and the easiest thing to do is tell people who you already care about that you care about them and give them a chance to say they care about you, and even if there's just one person, now you have something to grow. That is a beautiful practice and a great place for, for people to start. Thank you for sharing that idea. And thank you for spending time with us today. I, I really enjoyed talking to you about your book, The Art of Community, Seven Principles for Belonging by Charles H. Vogel, uh, published by Barrett Kohler. Very excited for our listeners to get a hold of it. Thank you again, Charles. Thank you. You've been listening to Nonfiction for Life, the podcast with authors who write compelling true stories and books with great ideas for living well. Today our guest has been Charles Vogel, author of The Art of Community, Seven Principles for Belonging, published by Barrett Kohler. You can find a link to his book on our website, Nonfiction for Life, where you can also sign up for our email list. When it comes to nonfiction, we believe there's something for everyone. Thanks for listening.